On a Sunday afternoon in 1936, a young boy and his father played hooky from church and took a sightseeing trip in a Ford Trimotor over Warren, Ohio. The young boy was impressed and soon was flying in the back seat of an Aronka champion. However, it was not long until he was in the front seat and at the controls himself. At 16, the age most boys are working on their driver's license, he obtained his pilot's license. So began the aeronautical career of Neil Alden Armstrong. Like a lot of flyers, Neil continued his airplane education with the assistance of the government. He interrupted his formal education at Purdue to study at the Annapolis of the Air, Pensacola, where he majored in SNJs. It was here that he sharpened the skills of his trade, and it was not too long before he got a chance to use those skills. During the Korean conflict, Neil flew over 75 combat missions, earning several medals for his exploits. But not all of these ended happily. One flight concluded with Neil nursing a leaking F-9 to a soggy rice paddy in South Korea. After Korea, he resumed his studies at Purdue and graduated in 1955. Later, he became a research pilot at NASA's Flight Research Center in Southern California. Here, he flew almost all of the Century series of jet fighters. The F-100. The F-101 the F-102, the F-104, and the F-105. He also piloted the F-5D, the KC-135, and the B-47. During this time, he served as launch pilot on the extensively modified B-29 that was used to air launch the X-1E. He also flew the X-5, the first aircraft capable of sweeping its wings in flight, a technique in use on the F-14 and B-1 of today. While at the Flight Research Center, Neil made several flights in the X-1B, a rocket-powered airplane that eventually reached speeds up to 1,600 miles an hour. And in 1958, he was named as one of the original seven pilots for the X-15 program, which was later acclaimed as the most successful of the rocket-powered research aircraft. Specializing in stability and control, Neil worked closely with engineers in developing an adaptive flight control system that would eventually allow the X-15 to fly to near-orbital altitudes. He piloted the first four flights on this system in the number three X-15 and later received the AIAA's prestigious Octave Chanute Award for this effort. Although originally developed in the early 1950s to increase man's knowledge of hypersonic aeronautics, Manned spaceflight was the immediate beneficiary of the X-15 flight research program. The program dramatically demonstrated the capability of the human pilot for employing a fantastic variety of acquired skills in sensing, judging, and coping with the unexpected. The X-15 was air-launched as far as 300 miles from its destination. The rocket engine would only burn for 90 seconds until its fuel was exhausted and the aircraft would continue its climb ballistically to altitudes in excess of 300,000 feet and speeds over six times the speed of sound. Yet, barring any unforeseen mechanical problems, the pilots were almost always able to maneuver their hypersonic glider to a landing within 1,000 feet of their intended mark. In the early 1960s, Neil became involved with the development and testing of a new concept that was being considered for use as a possible method of recovering both manned and unmanned spacecraft. Although the concept showed promise, 
Subsequent testing revealed operational problems that made the paraglider more suitable for hang gliders rather than spacecraft recovery. It was during this same time period that Neil, flying a prototype jet fighter, developed a technique for the abort rescue of a new manned spacecraft under consideration. It was called the X-20 Dinosaur and was to have been built for the U.S. Air Force. It would have been launched into space using a Titan III booster. Once in space flight, the X-20 would orbit the Earth using a principle called dynamic soaring, developed originally by the Germans during World War II as a method of bombing New York. Once the speed decreased, the spacecraft would re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and land like a simple glider. After serving as a member of the original X-20 pilot team, Neil was named in the second astronaut selection in 1962. His first flight assignment came with fellow astronaut Dave Scott as the crew of Gemini 8. On March 16, 1966, the Agena target vehicle roared into orbit. One revolution later, Gemini 8 lifted off the launch pad. Six hours later, the first docking in space had occurred. But after 30 minutes of dock flight, the two joined spacecraft began to tumble. Assuming the problem to be with the unmanned Agena, Neil undocked and separated the two spacecraft. Unfortunately, the problem was on board Gemini, which began to tumble even more violently, completing a full revolution every second. Using backup controls, the two astronauts were able to make an emergency re-entry flight path over China, and the crippled Gemini made an early splashdown in the Pacific. Back on Earth, Neil began to train for his Apollo 11 mission with flights in the lunar landing research vehicle. This strange-looking craft would help train him for the actual landing. But these flights were not without their problems. In May of 1966, a loss of helium pressure caused a premature shutdown of the flight controls, and Neil ejected. Fortunately, he was not seriously injured, and the accident had minor impact on the upcoming mission. Preparations for the Apollo 11 flight otherwise went forward without serious delays. On July 16, 1969, at a quarter past four in the morning, Neil was awakened. At 5.30, after a breakfast of orange juice, steak, scrambled eggs, toast and coffee, he and his two crewmen, Mike Collins and Buzz Aldrin, began to suit up for their historic trip. At 6.27, the trio departed in their van for the eight-mile trip to the launch pad. Almost 10 seconds before liftoff, the first of the Saturn V's first stage engines ignited. From the viewing stands three and a half miles away, the flames appeared as a bright yellow-orange star on the horizon. Soon, the other four engines fired, and the light of the engines became a huge fireball that lit the scene like a rising sun. On schedule to within less than a second, Apollo 11 blasted off from pad 39A at Cape Kennedy, Florida to start what has been called the greatest single step in human history, a trip to the moon, a manned landing, and return to Earth. Four days into the mission, already in lunar orbit, the crew began final preparations. 75. Six forward. 60 seconds. Lights on. Down two and a half. Forward. Forward. Good. 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. Straight shadow. Four forward. Four forward, drifting to the right a little. Ready? Down a half. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, the Eagle has landed. Good. 
Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Uh, Buzz, this is Houston. F2, one one sixtieth second for shadow photography on the sequence camera. I'm going to step off the limb now. I'm uh, at the foot of the ladder. The lamb foot beds are only uh, uh, depressed in the surface about uh, one or two inches. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for 